Um, yep. Yeah, I thought this chapter was quite easy overall, actually, um, because it's really yeah, distinct I mean, to the other one. We could kind of just breeze through it if you like. Um, I guess one thing would be just like, and you know, I kind of came to the game late, so I don't know how you guys best prefer doing things but we kind of just skimmed through and like if there were things that like maybe we didn't quite get <laughs> that we could kind of maybe help each other out with i don't know um oh i feel like i had a question or two which hopefully i wrote down somewhere um or we could just kind of uh like i say we could just kind of breeze through maybe even on this one Because to me, this one was just, well, keep going and add predictors. So as you say, it, it seemed pretty straightforward, really. Well, yeah, the complexity of adding predictors <clears throat> as you get, if you when you read statistical learning is the uh, the interactions, multicollinearity, you know, all the other, mm -hmm. all the usual stuff. Uh, what else? Oh, uh, what's the opposite of an outlier? Uh, so, well, not not opposite outlier, but within uh, the predictors, you've got like a weird value in your uh, predictor value. Um, like a high leverage point. That's it. Yeah, high leverage yeah. point. Those kind of things. Um, Gaussian distributions, or what you know, uh, the or cap, the count version, whatever that is, etc. The Poisson. Yeah. Poisson yeah. Let's see. So, so yeah, this was uh, pretty straightforward. So they added the high school and the IQ. And then they had just that the I noticed too, there were errors. He said mom high school equals zero twice. So I fixed that. Mm. <laughs> Very minor errors though. <laughs> He's very good. He, he didn't have a lot of, uh, or, or like typos or whatever when I went through. Um, let's see. So yeah, so this one, the gray one, right? The gray one is uh, mother has high school, I think. Yeah, mother has high school, so a little higher. Yeah, so yeah, because that's something like, if the mother has high school, regardless of IQ, they're six points higher. Um, but right. there, there's an interactive effect for the fact that if they, for instance, finish, high school and they have a high IQ then the child's more likely to do well on the test score mm -hmm. or something like that well it doesn't appear that way when you look at the regression lines does it yeah it's interesting so we can go down and there was that whole weird thing oh, where, there we go. yeah so so it's like the slope is weaker for the mothers finishing high school mm. um I'm not entirely sure what to make of that. Maybe it's just that they're they're in a more compressed range. Therefore, yeah. So like with the mother didn't finish high school, it's kind of, mm. you know, it's all over the place. Could be terrible. <laughs> could, you know, you could have a genius child. But then, yeah, if you have the high school, you tend to maybe there's, you know, sort of this range you dwell in. And then since it's not as, high, but, but then you kind of wonder where you get way over here. Cause you got like the high IQ mother. It's like, I don't know if she's like, she's just so smart that, you know, she uh, quit high school. <laughs> she didn't need it. I don't know. So it's just, yeah, it's just weird. When mm. you see these is it 140 here. high. Uh, yeah. I think 140 is um, a couple standard deviations perhaps. I think like 150 was considered like a genius IQ. Yeah, here you go. Here's some genius moms. Well, it's, it's, it's got, yeah. It's got yeah. to depend on the, uh, what's it called? But you can tell kind of by the this distribution, I suppose, where it gets thin at the... The problem is, yeah. The problem is IQ tests aren't so great on the very extremes of the periphery. Right. I mean, I mean, they're really good for overall population measures. Like, you know, people like to berate them and say, oh, they're not very good. It's like, well, actually, I mm -hmm. think, well, or G, as they call it in uh, cognitive sciences, is, you know, one of the best, probably um, one of the best understood uh, cognitive constructs, along with things to do with vision, memory, and uh, what's the other one? Oh, personality is really well done because it's basically you can't do personality well 
doing loads and loads of statistics so it kind of forces a lot of right. good statistical analysis um but yeah I, I mean it depends on the test so um because i'm thinking that some tests have an upper limit of like 140 and some some have an upper limit of 160 and i can't remember what they are anyway never mind uh it's relevant um, it could be. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that the, the vast majority of your population is going to live in this range. And then, yeah, they just kind of zoomed out. So, yeah, so, so what, yeah. what this is showing here is that, start, that your starting point for mothers who don't have schooling um, or haven't completed school, their starting point is lower. Mm -hmm. But if they've got a higher IQ, the child's test score is more likely to be high regardless. But of course, yeah. Okay. Um, whereas, yeah, the... I mean, it could be that there's just so many more points for the uh, people who finished high school than the people that didn't. Uh, yeah, that, that's possible, certainly. So that so it's more like so potentially that it's more likely it's being uh, influenced by outliers, but that's not what they're talking about here anyway. Right. What it seems to be talking about is like despite finishing, yeah. So it's like you said earlier, if you drop out, if you're really smart and you drop out of uh, high school, potentially you're set free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could just go wild and uh, yeah, potentially. I don't know. This is an interesting question i guess we could look at like subsets of the data i mean perhaps it just is partially just the fact that if you don't have high school there's much more variance which gets captured mm -hmm. I, I don't know. what year is this data 1988 no that's, that's a good question and i i can't say that i know let's look at the book does it say Oh, this was something that it was talking about, wasn't it? Which was counterfactual predict, uh, counterfactual changes within individuals rather than comparisons. Hmm. Coefficient is the expected change caused by adding one, leaving all others unchanged. This sort of interpretation ar arises in causal inference. Predictive considers how the outcome varies when comparing two groups differing. Hmm. Let's see. So yeah, I'm not entirely sure what to make of this. Uh, Attraction term. This, this is where it, it, you, it, you would also do things like, so like when I was, not to keep going back to it, but in um, statistical rethinking, they would they would often compare the models, which I don't think that um, Gilman is a huge fan of maybe. And, and just, yeah, because if you do the statistical rethinking, you could, you could fit several models and then it would actually give you weights for each model to indicate, you know, weight this one by 0.9 and this one by point, yeah. So, so that was kind of an interesting uh, other perspective. Or you can use um, that ANOVA test, which I don't know what you would use for this approach. I always thought that was quite weird to compare it using an ANOVA to compare different uh, model results. Yeah, it's, um, it seems like it's a little bit of magic, <laughs> but it's, inter it's an interesting. I don't, yeah, I don't, so I, so I don't think, yeah, I actually don't think Gelman is a huge fan of it. I don't know about these other people. Um, but yeah, so statistical rethinking, they were using information criteria, which I, I suppose is a little bit, you can make a little bit more of a case for that. Um, so that would be the way to kind of compare models. Now, do they kind of, I think, I think there's a chapter coming up maybe where they talk about, well, they talk, yeah, they talk about um, model evaluation, cross-validation. So, I mean, you can do things like that, certainly. Um, see how your different models 
perform because presumably the idea is that yeah when you do the um or you can just use r squared which i guess generally people don't really love to do a lot of that but it's 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 a number <laughs> so yeah i don't know it appears that my uh, r session did not enjoy the um <laughs> did not enjoy j compiling uh, oh, you had similar document. to what I had, then it sounds like. Yeah. Oh, well. <clears throat> so, um, so if we go through it, so basically, we're adding additional information into the model, then we're adding in interactions, they're specifying the exact interactions here. Um, mm -hmm. By selecting uh, x1 two x two but if you had three you could do through to uh three x and then you do all the interactions wouldn't you mm -hmm. um and then the times is more kind of explicit and use the uh star sign right this says use them all yeah oh yeah he'd say i prefer this yeah yeah yes well, um, so what is counterfactual? Um, the most uh, careful interpretation of this is that term. Oh, yeah. Like, what if the IQ of the mother was higher? Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of the what if sort of question. What if we took this person and then the mother's IQ was higher or something yeah. like that? He also yeah. spends a lot of time, um, what's it, talking about um, how exactly you should phrase um, your mm -hmm. interpretation of the data, uh, which right. is this holding all of this constant um, kind of thing, which starts to become quite clunky language. That leads me to kind of a question for you. Since you work with, you know, a technical company, mm -hmm. um, do you find it's easier to sort of communicate your findings and such, or do you find that it's still pretty challenging that, yeah, if they don't have like a, a statistics background or a grounding? Well, the thing is, they're all very well educated people. Um, so right. they follow things, but they don't really understand statistics. Um, the high baseline at least, yeah. But like, you know, you take your average programmer and the, you know, or your average developers, we call them, and they're usually pretty, pretty well educated people, and right. you know they'd probably be in the top ten percent of any class of most classrooms, typically speaking. You mm. know, um, uh, that's just a complete guess. But in my experience, the the thing that decision makers care about is just that you say something on the lines of "this is more accurate than our last one," and it increases our percentage points. Uh, what we expect to happen in a particular situation by so many percentage points. Right. If you can do that, then they're happy. Then they're happy. They, it's we, all about simplification. Yeah. And if you can demonstrate as well, like I use a lot of, um, so rather than telling them the formulas, I use a lot of graphs in order to. Uh, yeah, say. So, you know, same. when you're doing time series, you can basically yeah. uh, write this next G boost model. So this picks out um, a lot more of the. Um, kind of like what I'd call the uh, what does it do differently? It doesn't rely so much on the sequential information so much as it relies on the direct information that it gets and therefore it can pick out more some aspects of the residuals that say a neural net model can't. So a neural net model might follow the trend better mm -hmm. and pick out some of the residual information um, but it doesn't quite capture the kind of like edges i suppose of the uh cartesian space that we've cr that we're using for each instance of time mm -hmm. um so uh, but you wouldn't explain that to um you wouldn't talk about it in yeah like, that in would rud like in the, that rud rudimentary language cause their head to explode i don't know okay mm -hmm. how do you how do you tend to deal with communication um, well, I think, yeah, you kind of hit it on the head a, a lot, awful lot of visualizations, <laughs> the more the better. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and, but then just, yeah, a lot of times numbers or, 
doing comparisons, like saying, well, we used to use this method and, you know, if we use this method, we capture, you know, much greater accuracy. So yeah, exactly. Kind of like you said, you have to point to, you know, what kind of gain you're, you're getting by actually doing things that way. But yeah, you can't really get into too much of the statistical aspects. And then, yeah, I think something that is a challenge is that they don't love uncertainty and then so much of statistics is uncertainty. So that's <laughs> kind of a challenge challenge area. Um, but uh, when you're talking about manufacturing, that actually can be a good thing because a lot of what you want to do with manufacturing is, is very simple. You just say, you know, here's an area where things are, are kind of just wild and all over the place. So, so that indicates that's probably an area we need to focus on, you know, either the process or, or, or some aspect of it to get it to be more what they call under control. So, mm. So I guess that's kind of the, the way in to um, get people to live with uh, uncertainty. It's like you, you, you find it and then you stomp it out. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, it's like, I told you the other week is like I was spending a lot of time with, uh, what's it, um, anomaly detection. Yeah. And basically found that our system wasn't very good. And it was just kind of like reprofiling data if the data wasn't any good then it wasn't very good at picking out um oh, the, yeah. the new data in the profile so yeah. uh i found that what's it um isolation forests actually work really right. well yeah you were talking about, yeah the isolation forest yeah. but you could probably do you know i hadn't really thought about this before but you could probably ensemble um uh outlier detection the problem is some outlier detection just gives some really weird results anyway um Nature of the problem is, is such, yeah. You're dealing with what is just, what are the oddballs of your data, so yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's, 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 it's strange. Um, I can't, with uncertainty, we don't really deal with it so much, even though yeah. well, we do, but we do deal with it in, within tuning parameters. And we also right. basically say, when we're doing forecast, yeah. that we have a kind of like tolerance to yeah, customers yeah. you know we would expect this within whatever but when we give them the forecast we don't give them with error bands because the problem is is that nobody um hmm. a lot of times they're not real happy when they see <laughs> yeah it's like you say it's like if you say oh well this will be accurate within 95% confidence into the 95% confidence value lies somewhere between these parameters and it'd be yeah. like that's quite wide isn't it yeah, yeah, like yeah. well you're the one who wants to know what's going to happen in 12 weeks time right um, right exactly um yeah it's a very, very much a learning process yeah anyhow sh shall we um shall we crack on um so we shall crack on yeah so we talked about the counterfactuals. You have to accept that regression can be difficult to interpret. Yeah, that's true. Um, this was something that we were discussing earlier in the uh, um, introduction to statistical learning. What you know, what's the difference between um, um, inference and prediction? Mm -hmm. And, and um, I, I read up earlier about this, and it's basically was saying, well, in inference, in inference, we're um, trying to um, maximize goodness of fit, mm -hmm. as it were. Whereas with prediction and also explainability of that information, uh, right. whereas in, in in prediction, we're aiming to uh, create the most accuracy in understanding, mm -hmm. and therefore we're trying to get the best trade-off between bias and variance um yeah. and as a consequence uh, that makes your models more accurate but typically speaking the best models for infer inference aren't always the best models for prediction because you have to make sacrifices in terms of model complexity um but then, yes, and then yes, like that's... i don't know when i was in academia you know you wait adding uh, like a polynomial value into into a uh, into over suddenly makes things very difficult to explain mm -hmm. it's easy to explain something like um, just a exponential or logarithmic function 
but as soon as you start adding like in additional orders it becomes very difficult for uh, academics to understand and even to write about right De definite trade-offs there yeah so we can talk about let's see interactions hmm. And so this is what we received as a result. The error is normally distributed, standard deviation 18. And again, we look at the two. Okay, so again, we've kind of, we kind of took a look at this and then zipped back. Hmm. Um, yeah, and then I guess neither of us are, are entirely sure <laughs> how to interpret uh, uh, some of this, but yeah, I would I would be curious. I think maybe a follow up action for me is maybe to to dig a little further, see, you know, to what degree does does adding that interaction term um, improve the model? I guess that it would be something I'd want to know. I, I know um, that the second yeah. one was just to show how absurd the um, the interaction, sorry, the uh, intercept is. Yeah, well, it definitely captures that because, yeah, well, and, and as they say, the idea of someone having an IQ of zero, how did they ever get married or find a mate and have a child? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, it's like, yeah, the, beyond a certain yeah. point, just doesn't yeah. mean anything. Yeah, so you think this is like, this is where humans live in here. Um, so that's kind of what would you call the domain of your function. Um, and then, yeah, over that range, you see the outcome. Okay, so then they give us kind of this prescri yeah, prescription of when to look for interactions. Look for them with predictors that have large coefficients when not interacted. Which I guess I'm leaves, not sure I agree with that. <laughs> I, I wondered about that myself. And when I say like, you know, flagging things as questions, that was kind of a question I had. Um, that's page 136. Let's pop into that book real okay. quick. Let's see if there's more around that. Oh, interactions are important, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so the example they give, smoking is associated with cancer. In epidemiological studies of other carcinogens, it's crucial to adjust for both smoking as an uninteracted predictor and as an interaction because strength of association between other risk factors in cancer can depend on whether the individual is a smoker. Okay, so I guess that's a way of accounting for that. That supports the supposition that strong, um, strong beta values are yeah. likely to have interactive components. But what they don't do is provide one where it's um, provide an example where, for instance, well, a good example in the interactive effect is like a you know quite often when you're building a model you'll end up with mediators. Um, mm -hmm. which don't really have any direct effects, but they do when mm. they're interacting with another term. And that's, you know, pretty common. To be right. honest. Um, so how would you model that in a regression? Well, it would have to be part of an interactive term. Mm -hmm. Right, and then it's interesting. So you say they're called mediators? Is it mediator or moderator? I can never remember which mediator way around it is. Moderator. A mediator maybe has a uh, has its own effects. One of them has uh, has partially its own effect and also an additional effect, and another one has a, just an effect on one item. So, so they're by themselves; they are not important, but as part of an interaction. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, there are definitely uh, lots of examples of that. I suppose. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, mediator is in between, you know, you have an X variable, you've got a mediator variable, and it influences the, well, your X value, which will influence your Y, whereas a moderator will not have a direct influence on the X variable. Um, sorry, oh, I... direct influence on the dependent variable. It will have an uh, impact on the, it will moderate the value going. Um, I think this is probably a pretty good image. Let's see. Copy image. I'm sorry, what was the last thing you said? I 
ขึ้นให้เออเหมือนเราไม่เอ่อเอ um, uh, basically um, so a mediator kind of is in the path of influence oh when you're talking about causal inference yeah whereas a moderator only kind of seems to influence the actual um, uh, the actual like say predictive value mm-hmm. Uh, you can look at it like uh, so. I'll add this image to um, to the Slack. Oh, okay. So it's in yeah. the Slack. So you yeah. can see it in there, um, and that kind of shows you how how it works. Oh, okay. Mediator model. So perceived enforcement, personal beliefs, underage drinking. Uh, so if we look at underage drinking as our Y value, the personal mm-hmm. beliefs can uh, are a mediator and therefore have their own effect on underage drinking, but they also um, so that's mediated that's mediation where they it works together with the perceived you know with the other so it's kind of like two kind of like an interactive effect I suppose. Mm-hmm. Whereas the uh, moderator effect is one where it doesn't have its own effect. It just moderates the. It just has the interactive component, so there's no direct effect on the y value. Okay, so so oh yeah, I see. So depending on your personal beliefs, uh, perceived enforcement influences basically the effect of the personal beliefs, but it's not. It doesn't have any direct influence. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, you tend to see this more in kind of like structural models, um, yeah. but st- structural models are basically just really big networks of regressions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Let me copy that. That's good. I have another book that goes more into the causal inference, but I haven't dived into it yet. As, as we already discussed, there are so many books. Um, <laughs> but, well, there is there is yeah. an infinite amount of learning to do for the rest of our lives. <laughs> so much t- little time. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, that's very interesting. Yeah. So, thank you for that. That's what I meant by you know, for instance. Well, actually, the large coefficients thing probably true, but also yeah. misses some things out. It, it, it's, yeah, I don't think it's really getting at the root of what you're looking for, maybe, perhaps. Um, yeah, it's just sort of, maybe it's just kind of a red flag thing where it, it leads you down a different path. But yeah, if you look at it in terms of something like this, I feel, yeah. I think this, uh, this is a case yeah. of, um, yeah. you know, we have to remember that this book is basically for undergraduates to, uh, I suppose. Right. Uh, well, it, yeah, it's aimed at people that are, I, I believe it's aimed at people that are not statisticians. But because the authors are statisticians, I, I figured that it would probably be of value to, to read it. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. Yeah. They, cut, they bring up some interesting points. And also Bayesian yeah. statistics has been impenetrable to me for a long time. Right. Yeah, so I feel like anything I can read to kind of help me get a grip on that, I, I appreciate. So, mm-hmm. yeah, good. So this next section talks about um, uh, indicator variables, um, and uh, that's basically just different factor levels, essentially, which right. we can interpret as one hot uh, encoding. To in most cases, right. I'm pretty sure that's the default in R um, because it saves space. Right. And then we, we talked about this a little bit in the Slack, uh, whether you want to center and standardize things. But yeah, they, yeah. they centered this predictor. Um, Which makes sense to do. It totally does. It's good, I think, for interpretation. So now we have height plus uh, male to see if it's true. If you're a tall man, you're going to get paid more. Uh, <laughs> so let's see. We did have effect. Um, but here we're just saying posterior predict. Yeah. What is what is our prediction? We get this. 
Uh, okay, so yeah, so so going back to what you said, so then then we have something where yeah, there's multiple factors. Um, here they were they were just looking at what's the breakdown. I thought this was interesting in terms of like what are your uh, betas for like a very large group versus a, a small group. Oh, I didn't. Or what, or what is your what is your error rather? I guess I should say so. Like yeah, you have a wider error for other, and then there's very few others in that, yeah, so. Well, if that makes sense, like, you will have wider sense. area. area. Yeah. Um, actually, that was something I meant to ask, because you did mention it earlier, which was um, about weighting, because yeah. surely you'd want to weight those uh, factor levels. Yeah, yeah, it's like when you do machine learning and you have um, class imbalance, and then it becomes a giant pain in the ass to, to predict things, <laughs> so yeah. You have to do weird things like upsampling or downsampling. Yeah. In this case, you have a very strong effect, the negative, it appears, although with a well, lot of uncertainty. This is where they swapped it around, isn't it? So they um, yeah. used uh, the factor order to change it to white as the, um, the default value or intercept. Oh yeah, down here. Yeah, so so this was a good tip. So, which probably I guess that would make sense because it's the biggest class. Is that kind of what we're saying with that, or or is it just kind of a, a luck of the draw well, thing? Because I, I guess ultimately your model's the same. It's just sort of the way it's expressed. Well, they don't mention that here, so they yeah. haven't done anything about the cat the class sizes. Yeah. Um, I, I presume what they're just doing here is introducing you to the problem. I mean, considering they mentioned weightings very early on, you'd have thought that they would have just explained, right. well, here we also have class imbalances and something you need to take account of. Right. Oh, this is actually, oh, I, they're not talking about earnings, they're talking about weight. But again, it does make sense. White people are fatter, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Well, actually, in this case, it's not looking good for other ethnic groups. Um, yeah, well, so if based on the height. Technically and the, speaking, yeah. black people have higher muscle density. Um, this is true. Yeah, I, I feel. Um, then or then or the other racial groups. So as a consequence, you tend to see that. And well, then muscle weighs more than fat. So that tends to hmm. yeah, send you in, in a certain direction. Um, then male tend to be heavier, tend to be taller, I suppose, as well, although we are including height here. Um, but height relative to the average, height for human. Um, yeah, so let's see. Okay, so now they did, so this is just, they're, they're talking about different ways of approach you get, right? So they changed the mm -hmm. baseline. Then they did, let's try it with a lot of dummy variables, mm. which, you know, as you said, doesn't really do anything different. It does, does nothing different. <laughs> so it's like, you might as well just use the factors. Um, yeah, they, I, you know, I just kind of feel like that was a pointless bit of coding that they showed there. It's like, yeah, oh, it's just kind of like, if you didn't believe it, now you believe it, sort of. Mm. So, yeah. Using, okay, so, so they had this uh, section down here. Where they're talking about it. See, and here's I was so happy I get the right equation. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah. Oh, so that's nice. Yeah. So yeah, the straightforward estimate is yeah the mean minus mean and the standard error is this uh, combination of the two. Um, yeah, with n over two square root uh, population parameters. Oh, yeah, so that's just say V T versus V C. And, and so, yeah, so they're just saying, okay, I'm going to uh, generate data based on this and then <laughs> go backwards, see what that looks like. Uh, so the control has this histogram and then the treatment has this one. And it's kind of interestingly weird, I guess, because our sample size is not huge. We wanted, yeah, so we have 200, so we have 100 in each group. 
Um, let's see. So then we fit it using treatment. We check the summary. So we see definitely uh, evidence of effect. The estimates two, the actual was two, so very good. Um, Sigma is one almost. So, okay, so posterior median is the estimate. Here's what we'd expect to find the standard error of that difference to be. 0.14, and I think they're just saying that would be compared to up here, I guess, it's close. Um, out of interest, um, the intercept there, is that the non-treatment condition? I think and then so. if you're and then if you're treated, there's an additional 2.05 for the effect. I think that does jibe with what they did because yeah, the non-treated, yeah. the yeah, it's gonna be three. So so it's close. I mean it's in the, the confidence interval. 2.6 to 3.06, and then 1.78 to 2.31. Now this next one was a little bit, um, a little odd to me. I don't know kind of what your take on it was, but so, okay. So now they're saying you pair everyone. So, okay, everybody's in a pair. Um, so when you do the paired design, you fit it to all data points, including the treatment indicator. And in, so, yeah, so now you're saying, let's do it for every pair of people. So that's where we have the, yeah, we just we just we just assign everyone to pairs, and then we look at so so we look at each individual pair. So it's kind of looking at it a different way, and looking at them all together, as we did up here. So we just said, here's the big control group, here's the big treatment group, and so here we just like take some pairs, see what's different. Um, we see it looks like yeah, it's kind of centered at two, which we would hope. Um, the summary is very long. So yeah, so this was what was weird to me. So it feels like, it feels like in a way when you go looking at it by pairs, you have so little data <laughs> because you, yeah, you have, it was that thing where you have almost as many variables as data, right? Um, yes. So, so it seemed like a kind of a funny thing to do to me in a way. Um, was this on page 143? Um, Let's see. Page we on um, because there was something on one four three that I thought was really weird. Um, it is. I'm seeing page one. Oh no, it's not. It's one forty. Forty. Yeah. The standard recommendation. Yeah. yeah, they say the recommendation for analyzing it is to compute the dif difference within each pair. So then you look at kind of the pairs and then just aggregate over that. So. Fit a model on, yeah, fit a model on all the points. Using factor to create the indicator variables. Oh, R avoids collinearity by taking one as the baseline and, and include, yeah, so again, it, it, it reduces that uh, potential for, uh, you know, the look at your left leg and your right leg as variables sort of thing. So the regression has N over two plus one. It does seem strange to do pairs like that, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a little weird. Because that's a, a pair for each row. Yeah, that's like very little data. <laughs> it's one, one point for each pair. Um, okay, so finally we get to, yeah, I don't know. And you do see how, hmm, what can we interpret based on this? They all have relatively small effects and then the errors are, are such. I felt like this, this could probably be uh, better explained. Right. Um, unless it, I do feel like this is a case of this isn't particularly important well, um, he only spent a third of a page on it in the book, so mm. I wonder to what degree. Yeah, I mean, okay, is it a different way of looking at it? Yes. 
I mean, <laughs> in, is, is this kind of like a tea test? In a way. Like a match tea test? Because he does go on later there, on to say they basically don't like tea tests. Yeah, I know. That was interesting. Or, or hypothesis tests. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, the way I'm interpreting it is it's kind of, and especially the guy who created this markdown, it's just sort of, let's look at the same problem from all these different angles. Hmm. Yeah. So let's see. So it says posterior is still about two. So that's great. Um, and then they actually draw the samples. Oh, I, I need to like change some of these. So you use as draws, I guess. Okay, since the condition, coefficient is conditional on the presence of the pairs indicator, it's the treatment effect with respect to the first pair. And then you have all your different pairs to, to get different things. It's like, I'm not sure why you would want to know uh, the pairs. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, I know that has importance in some tests. I suppose it but, might be useful if you were, um... <clears throat> If you were look, wanting to look at uh, your samples over mm -hmm. time, I would like say say you did sequentially a load of samples, and you want to see which sample, um, mm -hmm. sorry, how each sample changed as you um, went through the process. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd use time series for that. I don't know. So there's that. Because it's not a direct. T, it's not a direct comparison of group one and group no, two because you, then you just have a coefficient for it it's a pretty roundabout way to, to do the comparison yeah so it's just a conditional on the presence of pairs indicator yeah yeah so it's kind of like the baseline like oh here's the first pair mm. yeah i'm not entirely sure what that gained us Aside from knowing again what the treatment effect is, which seems consistent with the other approach, um, there must be a use for it. it, it yeah, would... I think I think if you do if you did dove deeper into experimental design, maybe it would make more sense. I yeah, hmm. perhaps. Because then they say, look at yeah. Because again, he only uh, the authors only devote a paragraph to the idea. Although this person here uh, was nice enough to come up with the example. So yeah, they're just saying then divide up into groups. So it's kind of kind of similar. Only now instead of the pairs, we we group people. So yeah, and we see again the treatment effect. So that would be actually group one, I guess, would be two. And that kind of just shows you how it can vary between groups, I guess. I mean, that makes a lot more sense to me because... That one, I, I can understand why you might want to do something like that. It, it seems yeah. yeah to make a little more sense. Well, that's, that looks like your standard uh, kind of like uh, psychology, neuroscience or whatever. Yeah. Kind of, or even like, you know, medical experiment. Yeah. Treatment effect. Mm. So then, then it go, gets, yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we've got, we're then going into uncertainty here. So this yeah, is my part favorite where I, There we go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like this is this is this um, is what we're here for. This is what we're here for. This is real real deal. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to the uncertainty part, and this is where I kind of get lost at this point here. So ah, okay. Like, and it's not because of we're uncertain because of the uncertainty part. It's because we have. In the book, in yeah. figure oh, ten point yes. seven, it goes sigma, and then it's got beta uh, zero one and two, and then it goes y one through to y four hundred and thirty five, which is to represent the different yeah. uh, seats in governments. Um, right, the the uh, districts, congressional districts, we call them. Yeah, so that's what what those are. Oh wait, have I uh, skipped forward some? Because it says here it's got. Yeah, for there is a Congress, congressional isn't it? districts. So yeah, so, so the Y's are for for each district. Yeah. 
they did something kind of funny too. Um, oh, it, well, actually, it kind of makes sense now if I read it. So, so he talked about, um, yeah, how he does this little recoding. But I, I understand what he was going for, or, or he, they, sorry, there's three mm-hmm. authors. There's Andrew, Jennifer, and Aki. Um, so what, what they're kind of capturing here, and maybe it's sort of arbitrary, is they were just saying, um, you know, let's just say if, if less than 10% of the vote for one of the parties uh, just just consider it uncontested. So so that was how they they had this, mm-hmm. which is kind of interesting because it looks like there's a lot more on this. Uh, looks like there's a lot more uncontested Democratic according to this. Uh, it's, I don't know. Interesting, um, but yeah, I kind of saw what they were going at because it's just a way of capturing the magnitude of that situation where there's you know no contest. That to me, that kind of made sense. He's like, I mean, does that kind of make sense to you as well as sort of a way to do it? I, I mean, it seemed like there's a little bit of a mm. kind of a judgment call because you know, is that is that considered a, a good thing to do to just say, okay, I'm going to call less than ten percent <laughs> uncontested? Mm. Um, well, I mean, it makes sense as they've done that in this particular context. Yeah. Um, but they've then imputed it with a specific value, which right. I believe they settled on the mean, which okay. you can do. Um, but so I'm got, surprised they didn't add well, in some. Sorry. Yeah, they kind of say, well, I'm almost sure it's going to be this, or I'm almost sure it's going to be this. And, yeah, yeah. That's kind of weird. I would have thought that it would be better to kind of like take those values and then add some uncertainty into them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's almost like you've you've uh, taken out uncertainty because you've said, I feel like, yeah, it's kind of like they've made the judgment call that in those cases, it's definitely going to go Republican or it's definitely going to go uh, Democrat. Yeah. Let's see. Well, they, 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 they actually know that they were untested though, I suppose, don't they? Right. Okay, so let's kind of look at, we can look at the book. So what information would be relevant is useful to know whether both parties are contesting. The spikes at the two ends reveal that many of the elections were uncontested. Okay. I think, oh, I, I think the way that might figure is so, so in the context of like the actual data generating process. So typically you would have your Democrat and you'd have your Republican, and then you could always have your third party candidate who unfortunately in the US system will almost never get very many votes. So I think they've somehow tried to capture that as a way of saying, well, you know, if, if the Republican is running against the Libertarian, the Republican is, is, is always gonna win. It's just kind of the way that things go. And so that was wow. a way. Yeah, but then I guess you still, but you still have that sort of, you know, you have the effects of third parties are, are still in here. So I don't know. Mm. Might might have been better just to get the complete votes and then just pull out yeah pull out the third party. I don't know. I just never quite sure how I feel about different voting systems. Yeah, um, there's 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 loads of others, and that people like to argue the merits of uh, yeah, yeah. versions. And what what I find from statistics, even from a statistical point of view, it doesn't make yeah. for instance PR which lots of people like to say is, is better because everyone's votes represented the same. It's kind of like, well, actually, that doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily something you should think about because what you have to think about is whilst millions of people will get a vote in, say, a city, and they'll all, you know, you'll get a lot more voting for the same candidate or not. Mm-hmm. Those people aren't there to represent a particular, they're there to represent an area, so you are represented by that person. But if you're mm-hmm. in a rural area, well, the rural area's um, interests are probably quite different to the city, but you need to represent the interests of that part of the country as well, because they're perhaps, you know, creating the food that supports the city. And mm-hmm. so you can't, nef- you know, if your politicians are meant to represent your area, surely the key isn't actually what the vote were is worth per individual in a particular area across the whole country, but rather what each vote is worth 
relative to its individual voting pattern, individual voting district. Mm -hmm. um, but even then, then you might argue, well, actually, maybe you should have like a transferable vote so that your vote still means something because then you've right. got a stake in democracy. But then again, you then got a question of if you have end up with like hung parliaments and stuff, well, some cultures work better with those and some don't. Mm. Anyway, uh, never mind. Uh, it's all philosophical. I'm not very good at politics. So yeah, me. Stay away from it. yeah. But um, it's interesting, though. Yeah, I, I guess you always wonder grass on the other side of the fence, right? So in the U.S., we only have basically two parties. So I always I always have tried to think of, well, how, what would be the benefits to have, have the other party? But the um, argument and point, is, sorry. Yeah. And then the you're talking about people in the city versus people in the country. Yeah, I mean, that's good as well. Um, I'm sure we have many districts where you will have a city and then you'll have many rural areas. And then the you know rural areas are so swamped by the city voters that they can't really be represented then. So. Mm -hmm. I mean that's that's just a one one example. If you think about it, like there's all sorts of places across the country with lots of different areas, and then there's also mm -hmm. fact that like, um, I mean from my example of knowing what what I do know about America, uh, like for instance in America is I, I'd probably consider both parties right wing, and I know the Republicans considered really right wing. But the right. Dem yeah. but, the de but the Democrats in, for instance, California look really right wing to me as well. Um, oh, yeah. That's not necessarily, necessarily a bad thing. It's more yeah, kind of like, accurate, yeah, rough, it's, rough. yeah, it depends on how they implement that because you can still right. have good people who are really right wing, you can have good people who are really left wing. Yeah. Um, it just really depends on what they vote for and when they vote for it and whether they're corrupted. corrupted. Right, right. Yeah, corruption is good to, to get rid of if you can. Yeah. Well, right. I'm sure you saw recently about the, was it Pandora Papers they're calling it? I, I don't know as much about that as I should. I'm aware of that. Do you, have you read much of the story or yeah? There's something what... to do with South Dakota is a great place for um what's it? Uh, you know how like people keep money in the Bahamas and stuff like that. Apparently oh yeah, South yeah. Or like really... tax, tax uh, shelters. Yeah, well yeah. apparently South Dakota I... is a really good place for holding trusts and uh, property in yeah. different parts of the world. So you yeah. can hold property in like say. You know, you know, billions of pounds worth of uh, um, real estate in uh, the UK, yeah. and you won't pay the same taxes, wow. or stuff like that. I, I don't know quite how it works. I, I haven't read into it fully, but it sounds like it's. Right. I need to. I need to read a little bit more about that. But yeah, I, I, I it's on my radar. It's interesting. Yeah, got to learn how to do it ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What, what if we have a lot of money? What, how who will look out for us? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, um, yeah. So, what I didn't quite understand about this section here was um, how why why one two why th four three five, which is I presume it's um, so what it's trying to do is predict for each y value. Yeah, for each so district. For each okay. district individually. Yeah. yeah. But then it simulates that uh, four thousand times. So each y, yeah. so y is in a way a factor variable that is being predicted on oh, yeah. each so model. This, this. Let's take a look real quick. So this is 1988 votes and whether they were incumbents. Yeah, so Democratic vote share at 86, Democratic vote share at 88. So we use then, this to predict this. So adjusted, adjusted. Let's see. Shape is, yeah, oh, so that just shows by their incumbents by the shape. It doesn't look like there were many. Um, uh, uh, was it closely contested areas actually? Was right, it, was right. It... no, yeah, it's almost completely separate right here. <laughs> yeah, so 
Let's see. Okay, raw data, adjusted data. Is that just where they took raw versus adjusted? Oh yeah, the adjusted and then yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, so here's adjusted. Da, 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 da. Here's raw. Da, 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 da. Yeah. So I guess that's how they dealt with this. I don't know. Just kind of hmm. got it into better shape. Sort of. Um, well, it would certainly be easier to fit a model to this than this, like, because <laughs> you don't have all these weird things going yeah, on yeah. out here. You essentially got rid of the outliers. Yeah, so that was just kind of a way of uh, dealing with that, I suppose. And then I suppose if you look at the Republican yeah. and the Democrat areas, they're largely, you know, within each group, they are largely well distributed. Mm -hmm. Mm, although having said that, one side, whoever the X votes are, their side of, oh, that would be Republicans. Adjusted vote share, 1988. This is more on the right side. Shape is incumbent, 88. Mm. Anyway, it's not like we're not analyzing this data set. Um, yeah, yeah. So, what's this doing? Past vote, current vote, incumbent. That's the data. And then it fits. Oh. So, generally, it's saying your incumbents will tend to win. <laughs> which we yeah. Um, because people prefer the status quo unless there's a good reason to get rid of them. Right. Unless, yeah, there's. Things are bad. Um, yeah. So now we fit the model. What do we see? Oh yeah, and it's got really small coefficients. Yeah, small coefficients for uh, incumbent even, yeah. A little small error as well. Oh, of course, it's between zero and one though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Intercept is 0.24. Okay, so then they said, let's uh, simulate for inferences and predictions. So what, what is he doing here? He's grabbing uh, samples. <laughs> oh, this is where it gets uh, funky, right? So he grabs the samples, he says, Prepared the data. Oh, okay. So we did all our 1988. And now we're going to figure out what happens in 1990. So we do simulate. So yeah, so basically we're saying we simulate 1990 using our 1988 model. Then what do we get? We get this big table. So that's Which, where it gets a little crazy because there's the 440. Of course, in real life, you wouldn't do this. You just use a predict function. Yeah, yeah. So I think this is where they're, yeah, trying to look at the uncertainty. Hmm. And, and he does some fun, uh, Tidyverse tricks and just sees. Yeah, so basically says across all of these districts, greater than 0.5 means we think the Democrats won by how much. Um, so top columns. I'm sorry, am I kind of zipping too fast? Or? No, no, this is fine. Yeah, so we'll go through, send in one, two, four thousand. So, so, okay, so here's kind of the end of our uh, journey. So we said, what what is our summary? So this would be mean, median, SD, or sigma, our two coefficients, three coefficients, I'm sorry. So they seem uh, 
Oh yeah, this was about point one, right? Which is what it said. Yeah, so the intercept, the um, this was the incumbent, and then this was the um, vote. Yeah, so they tend to repeat. And then we just look at each district, kind of how does it break down? Okay, I, I saw that he had a question here, but I wasn't able to kind of follow that one up. So the standard deviation estimate for Dems Pred, so I guess that's the sum of everything. Um, so how many districts do they win? The standard deviation, so much lower than the one in the text. So what did he have in the text? Let's see. Oh, in the text, he had 7.1. Oh, Lord. Yeah, that's a very different <laughs> answer. Um, so that's a good question, actually. I mean, is that just a simulation? Well, that's too much to be just a simulation difference, I would say. Maybe he did something different. Hmm. I mean, I'm pretty sure if Alice Curtin can work it out. Yeah, uh, yeah. We might struggle. Um, they might, uh, like, it could be. A Perhaps there's an error somewhere in his uh, methods earlier. I don't know. It's hard to say. Their mean and median are quite different as well, though. Mean and median, yeah. So they've I mean, got 260 versus, well, 260 versus 260, and then 260 versus 262.1. Hmm. I mean, the problem is, unless you set a seed, Right. So yeah, you would be using a different seed. I guess something that you could do is just try different seeds and see if it's like all over the place. I don't know. Oh yeah. Okay. But, <laughs> but that would make that would make you not feel good about the <laughs> the model. I guess I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, he must have tried this a few times. I bet he did. He seems pretty. I mean, we've got the same one in ours. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what I got. Yep. Um, hmm. So we've gotten kind of past four, and I should probably be wrapping up. But we can we can start at ten point seven next time. Yeah, no problems. If you like, yeah. Sounds good. It, that's a lot more theoretical, I think. The last part, isn't it? Yeah. So that's some. Um, yeah, I don't want to like start it right now <laughs> since we're already past four. So yeah, maybe ten point seven. We can we can pick it up. Yeah, sounds good to me. There's only a few pages left on that. Um, yeah. I might as well read chapter eleven whilst Matt's in next week. Right, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, I started. I I believe. Let's see. So before I joined the group, I was already to yeah. Okay, so I haven't finished chapter eleven. So actually, that brings everything kind of up to date. So yeah, I'll just finish chapter, or I'll review and finish the rest of chapter 11, and then we can talk about those, I guess. Okay, brilliant. Um, so yeah. good? I think overall this chapter wasn't too bad. Uh, it's just that they do some strange things with the paired comparisons, and then, right. the, um, and then Y1 through to Y400, because you're doing so many different districts. It's quite yeah. an interesting way of doing it. It's just not way I'd ever really thought about uh, doing a regression before. Right, it's not really something that I would jump at, at doing. Yeah, so it's just different. It's interesting. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. that's really cool. Okay, um, thanks for your time, Steve. Yeah, thank you, August. Always good uh, chatting, and we'll pick it up next week. Yeah, cool. See you next week. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.